Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Donna. I'm an alcoholic. It's nice to be here with you all. It's always an honor to be asked to speak. Um, when they asked me what topic I would like to speak on, for me it was step two, because step two was the most important step for me, because I couldn't have worked the rest of them if I was still insane, because I would have worked them a little crooked. And, um, and to my way of thinking, believe me, things were crooked. Uh, I came into this program when I was 27 years old and recently celebrated 17 years. I um, raised a son in this program. I did a lot of great things in AA and uh, got a degree in this program. But, you know, none of that would have been possible if, ha- if I had kept the thinking I had as a child into adulthood. I mean, if I didn't find alcohol, I wouldn't have been able to experience all the changes that I have found in AA. And for me, back in the day, I was – I brought that guitar in in case I felt like singing a song for you later. It was a song I wrote when I was 14 called Where'd the Light Go? And it was the first time I knew I had a separation from God. It was the first time I knew something was missing in my life. I was sitting in my room, and I had already started drinking by this time, but I had a reflection in the mirror and a candle, and I just knew that I was not connecting with God anymore. And I just uh, sat down and I wrote this song called Where'd the Light Go? Because there was a light that was missing. And when, this, when they talk about the sunlight of the spirit and the spirit within, that was when I know that that's when it was gone for me that I didn't have it anymore. And when I, um, I came from a house with four, four brothers and uh, a divorced parents, very abusive childhood. And as I got older, I learned survival skills. I became a bully like my dad when I was a kid. I used to beat up all the kids in the neighborhood. And where I came from, that was really normal. I lived in Queens, New York. And, you know, y- you always got into fights. That was par- part of what you did. And uh, I was always the one that got in trouble in school. My mother had four boys and me. The principal told her she should get a diploma because she was up there more than I was. And, um, <laughs> and my mother, God bless her, you know, she, she, had, uh, she had her hands full with me. I was one of the tomboys in the family, you know. I just always in trouble, always, always in trouble. And I think what happened was when my dad left, I was 12. And my dad was very strict, hit us with the belts and all that. When he was gone, all bets were off. My mom worked two jobs, and I was on my own. So when I was on my own, left to my own devices, what do we do, you know? We hang out with the crazier kids. We do all the the drinking. And my first drunk, I'll tell you about, was in this park called Grover Cleveland Park. And we used to go to that park because right there was a high school. And not everybody has a swimming pool in Queens like they do out here. So you'd have to go to the high school if you wanted to go swimming in the summer. So we would go to there, and we'd go swimming. And then we'd sit on the stoop and wait for the next session and go swimming again. And that's what you did in the summers in Queens. But there was a McDonald's down the road, so we'd go to McDonald's and eat. And then we'd come back. Well, just so happened the day I started drinking, they had this huge thing of wine in the park, the boys, and, um, of course, they shared. And I had to be very competitive, being a girl with four brothers, so I started guzzling this bottle after, after McDonald's. I'm guzzling, okay? You might know where this is going. Um, <laughs> I'm guzzling this wine, and uh, sure enough, I won. I stumbled away, and bleh, right? Now, it wasn't bad that I threw up. What was bad was that I threw up a whole pickle. And they knew I did not chew my food at this point. And that was my worst fear. Like, they're going to know I don't chew my food. Oh, you know, because when you have a large family, you eat fast if you want to have seconds. You inhale that food. And I, you know, I learned to eat without chewing. (laughs) And um, so here it was, this pickle, it told the whole story, you know. So that was my first drunk. And... You know, it kind of went downhill from there. (laughs) I started to chew my food, though. I became more conscious. Um, After that, I went into high school, and I did all the stuff that high school, you know, you you, the weekend warrior, you know, you have to go to school. You have to be a nice girl. But uh, basically, I was starting to do a little blow around 17 or 18 from high school, and I was on this thing called a co-op program where you go to school a week and you work a week. And uh, I worked in Manhattan and... You know, I was just, uh, I was probably one of those kids that needed a trade, like she's never going to go to college kind of kid, you know. You want to get her in a trade as soon as possible. And, um, of course, I did go to college many, many years later. But I uh, graduated high school, 
no major problems, but I was a bar drinker. I played pool. I drank in the bars. I was very social. That was my thing. I loved to go out. Never wanted to be home. I had a very close relationship with my mom. She got me a job at Mount Sinai Hospital with her. I was um, her sidekick. We would both work together. We drove to work together. We did everything together, and I was very close to her. And I would answer the phones, and I started to drink, you know, at work, though. And I would do things like write off thousands of dollars. I would say, ah, you know, they'd call up and complain about the doctor that did their surgery. And I'd say, he said that, really? He talked about his surgery? Ah, oh. he talked about his vacation while he was working on you? You shouldn't have to pay that balance. And, uh, and I would write off thousands of dollars, you know. It was like, you know. I mean, and, and I would love to find a collector like me. But um, so far, <laughs> I guess people work sober. <laughs> but I had a heart for people, damn it, you know. <laughs> So anyway, after this, my, I, I wind up getting pregnant, this guy I was dating. I was a little fearful of commitment. I was dating him for three years. And, um, and I didn't want to, yeah, I wasn't in love with him. He was a great pool player. You know, we shot pool together. I mean, we drank together. He, he played with me in the band. We had a great time. But I didn't want to get married to this guy, and I get pregnant. So I go to mom, and I say, what do I do? And she says, whatever you do, I'll back you up 100%. You want an abortion, you want to keep it, I'm behind you. So I said, ah, she wants a grandchild. I'll give it to her, you know. <laughs> so I had a baby for mom, and, um, and that's what I proceeded to do. I gave it to her. And she, uh, I guess she didn't want to keep him, you know. She was just like, honey, wake up. It's time to take care of your child. And I'm like, you said you'd watch him, you know. And she was like, that was yesterday, you know, because I wanted to go out and drink. I mean, I had nine months of not really drinking hard because I was pregnant. I did drink beer. You know, I'd go, to a, I'd go to a place where they were serving beer and had a uh, DJ, and I'm nine months pregnant, and I'd be dancing out on the floor, and people would say to me, you shouldn't dance in that condition, you know, and guys would look at me from behind like, mm, and then I'd flip around with the belly, <laughs> you know, I was okay, you know, I was going out dancing, I was on fire, you know, and I think these girls are just jealous, you know, and <laughs> never dawned on me that I was insane, you know, and uh but, you know, I was very good. I didn't do any blow during the pregnancy. You know, I still, I still pat myself on the back for that one. And um, after I gave birth to this kid, I was like, here, Mom, here, Mom, you know. And I stayed home, and I'd watch the baby during the day, and Mom would work. And, but we were very close. Like I said, we played Yahtzee every Saturday. You know, when Nintendo came out, we'd play Nintendo. Well, when my son was 12 months old, my mother got diagnosed with brain cancer. And she, she didn't know she had brain cancer. I found out, and they told me not to tell her, like, don't take away her hope, which was probably, I would not recommend doing that. I wish I had known better back then. I wish I had known more about medications. I wish I knew more about everything back then, but, you know, hindsight, well, you know, I didn't have it. My mother suffered a lot. She, they gave her six months. She died in two. And it was horrible for me because she was losing her hair, and I would stand there, and I would, now my disease took off. I'm drinking a lot. I'm doing a lot of blow, and I'm like, oh, my God, she's dying on me. How could she leave me, you know? She was losing her hair, and I would lay on the bed next to her like a wired-up animal and just stare at her like I was terrified of losing this woman. And when she finally died, it was like the rug came out from underneath me. I had this kid. I had no parenting skills. I didn't know how to be a mom. My stepdad, who had been sober seven years, started to drink, you know, and he started going downhill. So I wound up with this kid and this stepfather, and the house became one of these horrible places where my dad started dealing coke, my stepdad. And we had these people coming in and out, and it was crazy. And I was like, I have to get out of here, you know. So I left, and I had tried recovery. I went to a meeting. After, now, this was, mind you, I started going to detoxes at this point. I've been through seven. Now, my first detox, I said, I'm not like these folks. I'm not going to come in and out of here like a revolving door. You know, I came in there, and they seemed like they were swapping hot cocos. They knew, the, you know, I'm like, oh, please, these people, I'm smarter than them. You know, I'll do a lot better. By the seventh one, I wasn't so smart anymore, you know, because my dad would pick me up, and he'd say, oh, here, this is to help you clean the house, and he'd give me a substance. And so he was the enabler, and I could not seem to get out from under there. So I got my, my own apartment. I got out of there. Of course, I met a wonderful man. He only had a few felonies, and um, <laughs> which is, of course, where you go. You know, when you're vulnerable, you know, you, you know, my mother was everything. I was in this downtrodden depression. You know, I wanted to kill myself. So, you know, Mr. Wonderful comes along. Hi. And he was so quiet, you know. He was such a quiet man. I didn't realize that meant he was antisocial, and he just got out of prison. <laughs> go figure, you know. <laughs> I was just like, what a thoughtful guy. And um, so he, 
He was, you know, he he was nice, but he didn't understand my disease, you know. He he drank too, but not like me. You know, I was a drinker, drinker. So me and him would go at it, and I became a battered woman, you know, because I had a lot of spunk, and and I was not one to be put in a bottle. So me and him would we would fight a lot, and uh, toward the end, my, now my stepdad, I had started feeling guilty because he was really going downhill. He had a massive heart attack. When I heard about it, I went to the hospital to see him. And while I was in there, and of course I'm active, while I was in there, he took a massive heart attack. And I called the nurse, and I went in the bathroom into the ICU to take a hit. That's where my disease was at that time. I could not deal with nothing at that point. And I left that hospital after my father died. I tried to resuscitate him, stoned out of my mind. Come on, Gene, get up, you know. And finally someone just moved me out of there. And I went down to the corner store and got a six-pack of beer. And there was this guy there that knew me as a child named Augie. And he used to call me Powerhouse because when I was a kid, I'd play handball, high on speed. Whee! <laughs> and I, uh, I had a, uh, I was, I was a powerhouse, <laughs> and my hair was standing up. <laughs> but um, so he said, "Hey, Powerhouse, how you doing?" You know, and I was like, "Not good." You know, my dad just died. My stepdad died. And he said, "You know," and he gives me this track, "Jesus loves you." And he says, "Well, Jesus loves you." And I stood there and I looked at it and I had tears in my eyes and I was like, "No, he doesn't." You know, he can't. You know, this is from somebody who just took a hit in the bathroom of the ICU unit, okay? Jesus does not love me. And he was like, Donna, really, Jesus loves you, you know? And, and I took it, and I, my first was, okay, so he joined the Moonies, you know, poor Augie, you know? <laughs> we'll have to come back to him sometime and help him get back to earth. And, um, and I took, this, took the thing, okay. So I left, and I went home, and... Of course, Mr. Wonderful didn't like me being out a lot, you know, all night. Apparently, you know, I'd steal his car when he was sleeping. And, and he had no brakes, so I'd hit neutral at the stop signs, you know, and uh, just to go get my thing because he had a different thing. He used, to, he used to get high and nod. I'd get high and clean the house, you know. <laughs> and I would find guns in the house, and I'd throw them out the window. And he'd go, what are you doing, you crazy bitch? And I'm like, what did I say about guns in the house? Mm, nope. <laughs> throw them out the window. You know, I was just nuts. I really was nuts. And I had no idea I was crazy. I mean, I was just like, you know, I was really playing Susie Homemaker. What is with the guns in the house? Mm. You know, this guy was like, you're crazy. I mean, he beat the crap out of me. <laughs> and um, so one time he, he threw me a really bad beating, and I wound up in the emergency room with two black eyes. And uh, the doctor was like, what was this guy doing? I said, well, he was trying to choke me. And he was like, he saw too many movies. You know, you got to go. So they sent me to a battered women's shelter. And um, they said, let's, well, now, after this, this guy got arrested for something else. He was always in jail. But um, he called up the house because his mother said I was giving her a hard time. And he says, when I get out of jail, I'm going to shoot you, and I don't care if your kid gets in the way. So once he said that, I knew it was time to go. My, I wore out my welcome. And um, so <laughs> I took the two-year-olds. Come on, we're out of here. And the district attorney sent us to Harlem. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been to Harlem. It's a little dangerous there. Um, they said, no one will find you there. <laughs> they said, you ain't kidding. <laughs> So I'm in this battered women's shelter in Harlem where no one will find me. <laughs> and I'm going out there, drinking in the bars, getting loud. You know, I was an obnoxious drunk. I was not a happy. Now, I, now remind you, I've lost my parents. I'm alone. I'm homeless. Everything I own is in a shopping cart. I'm walking under the L with the shopping cart and the kid. I look like a Steve Martin movie. I have everything I own here, and I'm getting on a train to go out to a shelter. And, like, this is where my life had gone. You know, and it didn't even dawn on me. I mean, I stopped to get a, a shot of scotch on my way because, you know, you need something to keep you warm on the subway. And, and I was one of those people that would ride the subway with an open knife because you're all crazy. You know, and this is how insane I was. I really thought everybody else was crazy, and that's why I needed to have a weapon. <laughs> but I was paranoid. <laughs> didn't know it back then. I was one of those people that would get high. would never enjoy it. I'd be out the window looking and looking and... Finally, there were no windows left because I was homeless. And uh, I guess the landlord wanted rent. <laughs> it's like consistently, you know, every month she wanted it. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. But um, <laughs> she was really a thorn in my side. <laughs> and uh, so I left, you know, and I went to this battered women's shelter in Harlem. And uh, while I was there, now I'm still getting high. I'm still drinking. Now, I'm looking in the mirror, and there's nobody, nobody home. It's like one of those lights are on, nobody's home. I looked. I saw this diseased woman, and nothing, nothing was there anymore. It was like there was just this living, breathing disease. All I lived for was to get high, and that was it. There was nothing else. So, and I was 80 pounds, and I thought I looked great. I was like, I finally lost that weight. My shoulder blades are sticking out, you know. I thought I looked good. 
And uh, so I'm in the shelter one day when these women come in with tambourines and they're Pentecosts. And they got the tambourines and the organ. And they said, does anyone want to get saved? And I was like, ooh, 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 you know, Horshack, me. <laughs> I had nothing to lose, you know. I'm in a shelter in Harlem. My parents are dead. I've got this kid. I'm on crack cocaine. I'm drinking alcohol. I'm just waiting for someone to shoot me and put me out of my misery. And uh, so I jumped up, and they came over, and they prayed for me. And they all surrounded me, and they asked me to say the sinner's prayer, and I did. And bingo, spiritual awakening. I'm on fire. And they're, they're, they've got me high on the Holy Spirit. I'm praying in tongues. Ah, shut up. I'm high, you know. I'm like, i got to go to this church. <laughs> this is a good church, you know. I'm feeling good. Well, now, they, they tell me it's time to leave, that uh, this guy's getting out of jail. Now, I'm, I went to that church all week, but, of course, I still drank because, you know, why not? <laughs> and, you know, there was nothing to tell me not to drink. I thought I could find the spirituality and still drink. And so they tell me that this guy's getting out of jail, and it would be a good idea for me to leave the state. Okay, this is one of the great guys I picked, Jake. So I left the state. I said, they said, pick a town. I said, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a country western singer. Hey, send me there. <laughs> and they send me to Nashville. Okay. I didn't realize that the Salvation Army in Nashville didn't have the Grand Old Opry. <laughs> Apparently, they were just going to house me <laughs> and feed me and give me corn dogs. And um, which was fine because for me at that point in my life, I needed something. But now, just remember, I had just gotten lit on fire by the Holy Spirit. I was going to the Bible Belt. Okay, I'm reading that Bible back and forth. I know it verse and chapter, and let me tell you something, I'm on fire. So what do I do? I go to the churches there. They start kicking me out. They start preaching the Ten Commandments. I'm jumping up in the back. Don't water down the word. Don't you know? And I'm screaming at the pastors that they're watering it down. That's not what God intended. And they were like, get her out of here, you know. Throwing me out of churches. If you've ever seen the crazy person in church, that was me. <laughs> they, I mean, it was just crazy. But now I started realizing that I had a calling, okay? I was sent out. I was sent out. To, I, I was going to be a preacher, okay? It was, my calling was to cast demons out of all of the people that God put in my path. So, therefore, if you came near me, I performed an exorcism, you know? People would come over and tell me a problem. I'd say, hold on to that, sister. Come on over. Come here. I'd, shut that, I'd pray it out of them. And then <laughs> they, they told me I couldn't stay in that shelter no more. They said, you can't perform exorcisms here. And they'd keep moving me. So, so they kept moving me from one shelter to the next. And I was really legitimately high on my belief, and I believe God sent me. Matter of fact, my first AA meeting, I was sure you all needed me. <laughs> and uh, and that's what happened. I came into AA, and I at first I came back to New York. I figured he he missed me, and he did. First thing he said to me was, you know, he had just come out of jail, and he wanted to get laid. And, uh, excuse me. <laughs> anyway, so I cast out the spirit of lust, and um, that didn't work out too well with him. <laughs> you know, he's out there just coming out of jail, hoping that you know, not going to happen. So I'm praying, and I wind up in another battered women's shelter in Bayshore, Long Island. Now, I say I lived in the Hamptons, but it took me seven shelters to get there, okay? And each time I went into a shelter and I did this exorcism and casting out demons and preaching, boom, they moved me, move, move, move. Finally, I land out in Riverhead in a beautiful part of Long Island, and I've got this little boy who, thank God I had him, because when I was suicidal, I would have not made it without this kid. And... Um, so he comes out to the Hamptons with me. Now we're in the Hamptons. I finally get my first place to live. And they tell me at the last shelter, you have to go to an AA meeting. And I'm like, why? You know, I didn't have any problem with my drinking. You know, but they apparently did. Matter of fact, my brother, <laughs> my brother had sent out this cartoon. My brother was a cartoonist. And in the cartoon, it had a picture of me with a Budweiser in one hand and a Bible in the other. And it said, God sent me to save you. And there was a girl sitting there biting her nails that was terrified that I was going to help her. <laughs> And, uh, and this was the cartoon going around the family, like, you know, Donna's lost it, she saw God, you know. And um, so what happened for me was I still had very strong faith, but I had a lot of disappointments and a lot of resentments. And when I first came to AA, I mean, you couldn't sit next to me. If you told me you had a pain, I'd say, oh, come on, come on, I'll take you in the preacher, I'll pray on you. And I would pray, no problem. I would pray on people at AA meetings. And they would just keep saying, keep coming back, it's okay, just come back, keep coming back. <laughs> No problem. And they were very nice to me. And I thought, this is a nice group of people, you know. They were nice enough. They were happy. I'll come to meetings. 
And uh, so, and I was really just interested in the milk and cookies, because back east you get cookies, and I would take them home every night. I was like, anyone going to take that? <laughs> I was a thief. I was a little thief. I was terrible. I mean, I went to an AA meeting at a church one time. Now, I had this compulsive cleaning thing, as you know, right? You know, crazy person throwing the guns out. But I had this compulsive cleaning, but I was wanted to go to AA, and I was in this church. Now, people had to drive me to meetings. I'm in this church in AA, and they had these wonderful cleaning fluids in the bathroom. And I just like, I'm, I'm trying to be good, you know, but really I just couldn't help myself. And I just took two of them and put them in my bag. And, and now I'm waiting for the ride home, and I'm talking to the girl, and someone says, honey, you're leaking. And I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I'm leaking, and I'm like, oh, it's just coffee. And meanwhile, I'm going, shit, you know. And that was my first lesson with God, not to steal. God, I went home, I had to put my food stamps on the fan. I was like, oh, my God, I lost it all. You know, the ink went off them. But this is where I was when I came in. I was like, I, I was trying so hard to do the right thing, but I came from a really twisted place, you know. So when I started to come into AA, and really I had a woman come over to me, and I would share every time, oh, I'm on this wonderful journey with the Lord, and everything's wonderful. And this lady finally came over to me and said, you know, you're full of shit. When are you going to get honest? And I thought, I'm from Brooklyn. You don't talk to me like that. And she was like, oh, yeah, we do, you know. And <laughs> I was like, I said, well, what? Well, if you think you could do a better job than my sponsor, you sponsor me. So she said, I will. She said, stop reading Step 2 every day for 30 days. And that's why I love Step 2, because... It was that was when I had my real spiritual awakening. I started reading step two every day, and I started to see where I had really lost my faith. Here I was walking around spewing out words of faith, but I didn't really have any for me. I thought God had a miracle for you, yeah, but I didn't think God had a miracle for me. You know, and, and I went to this church once, and uh, the pastor was a little judgmental. And the girl that, the girl that drove me had said... Uh, Oh, Don, are you going to play guitar for the church? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'll see. So apparently she ratted on me and told the pastor I had cigarettes in my drawer. So, uh, yeah, so now there's only five of us in the church. That should have gave me a clue, you know, that there's something wrong with this church. It was a big church, <laughs> and five of us are in there. And then he says, some of you out there worship sobriety. And I'm thinking, mm, I'm the only AA member. It must be me. <laughs> and then he talked to me afterward and said I had to give up those cigarettes. And I thought, well... That's it for me. You know, no more church. You know, I'll just stay with AA because AA taught me progress, not perfection. So I was going home with this girl, and she said, so are you going to play guitar for the church? And I said, honey, I don't know if I'm going to hang myself or drink a bottle of scotch. I haven't decided yet. And she says, well, you know what God requires. And I'm like, hang myself, you know. <laughs> And, and the truth was, was that day I went out. Now, I lived up this long dirt road in Hampton Bays in the woods, not near anything. I was having culture shock, panic attacks, feeding raccoons. I mean, I was just like, you know, guy upstairs with a shotgun telling me not to feed them, you know. I'm like, Ugh, crazy people out here. And, uh, but anyway, I went out in the woods that day, and I started yelling at God. And I said, you took my mother. You took my father. You, I'm an alcoholic, homeless, single parent. You want my cigarettes now? Are you kidding me? And I went off, you know. And I screamed at God, like, how dare you, you know. And it was the first time I could really feel the presence of God in my life say to me, good, now we're communicating. You know, God was big enough for my anger. I was raised in a religion where you don't raise your voice to God. So for me to even go there, I was at the end of my rope. But that was also the beginning of my rope for me. Because I learned that to have a right relationship with God, I had to be honest. I couldn't fake it till I make it in that aspect of my life. I couldn't pretend I had a relationship with God when I didn't. I thought I did, but I found that it was just keeping me protected. It kept people away from me. If you came near me, I hit you with a Bible passage, you left. <laughs> it was not a problem, you know. And that was how I worked this thing. No one gets too close. Anyone that gets too close dies, so keep you out there. And, um, and no one can hurt me that way. And there was a lot of rejection and stuff in my childhood when my dad left. And, you know, I just had all that stuff that I brought with me from my childhood. So when I got sober, I, I prayed for someone strong and spiritual, and I met a born-again boxer. I met exactly what I prayed for, got exactly what I prayed for. This guy was a very nice man, a little damaged. <laughs> I met him at an AA dance, and, and he got the bulk of my insanity because here I was, you know, a year, two years sober, and I was just still doing things that were crazy. I mean, I, I went and called him one day to go food shopping with me. It was food stamp night, big night out for us. And, <laughs> you know, when you're poor 
It, it is. So I'm, I'm calling him out the window, and he didn't come down. And finally, I start climbing the drain pipe. And my son's going, don't do it. And I'm going, oh, no, it's okay. And sure enough, I climb the drain pipe. The thing breaks all over me. And I'm screaming, Jimmy! With all this water on me. And he comes out like, oh, no, <laughs> she's mad. And, and I was mad. So uh, he stood in front of my car and said, go ahead, hit me. <laughs> Boom. Only got the foot, though. And um, <laughs> thank God he was a friend, not a foe, you know. Because <laughs> then he goes to the supermarket with me, and he's hobbling around. I'm like, oh, stop it. You're trying to make me feel sorry for you, you know. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> You know, but this was normal. I mean, and, and, and I hadn't even, you know, it was just crazy. I called the police on him that day, you know. I called the police on him because my car door jammed because he had kicked it, and that's really why I was mad. And I called the police, and I said, this man kicked my car, and now I need $10 to go to the junkyard and unjam it. And he was like, oh, so he goes upstairs, he comes down, he goes, ma'am, he says you ran him over. <laughs> I said, regardless, I want $10 for the door. <laughs> and the cop just thought I was nuts. And then I said, he said, just, the man wants to know if you still want to go food shopping. And I was like, yeah, tell him to hurry up. We're late. Like, this was a normal day for us. You know, this was average. You know, this was how we worked. And now, because... Because he was, uh, he was a really uh, a good guy. But now, of course, it was my job to keep me sober and my job to keep him sober. So, you know, there were those incidents, a lot of those incidents, okay? <laughs> I mean, one time he just, oh, the poor guy. I just, I say the poor guy. I've married him after 16 years. I dated him for 16 years, okay? That's my fear of commitment, you know? And, um, you know, really just wanted to see how much he could tolerate. And so far, he's been doing pretty good. <laughs> So one time he uh, he went out and relapsed though, and it destroyed me. I went, I was chasing him around all night, couldn't find him. Finally, the next day he shows up at home, and I'm like, screaming at him, yelling at him. And so he uh, looks out the window. He's like, Oh no! So he wasn't going to come down because he knew I was mad, you know. And I went up, and now there was all these people in the restaurant having breakfast after church. Okay, and now I'm standing down there. I want to embarrass him. So, <laughs> I, know if you, I don't know if you've ever had that feeling when you want to humiliate and embarrass somebody that you feel betrayed you when they drank. So, uh, I'm standing down there. Now, he did have an issue with having sex because he was a born-again Christian. So, I'm standing there going, you Bible-thumping asshole, I can't even get laid. <laughs> now, everyone in the restaurant, <laughs> so he comes down. Now, he's humiliated. He comes down, and he's, he looks at me. He goes and puts his, kneels on the floor and starts banging his head on the ground. And I'm going, hmm, that's satisfactory. You know, that's pretty much what I wanted. You know, he looks like he's groveling and feels horrible. He gets up. Now I get in my car because I'm going to leave. I accomplished my mission. I humiliated him. I embarrassed him. And now everyone knows you drank. <laughs> and I get in my car. And sure enough, he walks over to it and whack with his head on the windshield. Cracks my windshield. My first car. Do you know how insane I went? <laughs> I, I chased him around the car with my keys. Ah! Well, he's bleeding from the hand. I'm like, get in the car. You go nowhere till we get a new windshield. Right? <laughs> Driving around, 4th of July. Nothing's open. It's July 4th. He's bleeding. The windshield's broken. We pull up to a deli. And they're like, oh, my God, are you two all right? And I'm like, yeah, do you know if that junkyard is open today? And they're like, they're like no, were you in an accident? Oh, no, no, it's nothing. <laughs> and, and he's like, please let me go to a doctor, please. And I'm like, not until we get this windshield fixed. <laughs> you know, and this was where I was crazy. I did not understand, like, you can't do this to people, you know. So I, he finally gave me 200 bucks, and I let him go. <laughs> And, uh, but that was where, that was the insanity, you know, and, and that was in sobriety. So when I started to really do step two, my sponsor had to really work with me because she said, you're nuts, you know. She said, you know, you're not even on step one. You're on step two because I came in knowing I couldn't drink and drug. I mean, I knew where it brought me. I was so much at the bottom. I mean, thank God for the other substances because they brought me to my knees a lot faster. But, but. Let me tell you, when I came into AA, my thinking was so screwed up. I was living in a shelter. I was wearing, I wanted to wear nice clothes to the meeting and put a dollar in the basket, but I was homeless. <laughs> and, and I really didn't get that, you know. You don't have to put a dollar in when you're homeless. <laughs> I just, uh, and I lived in the Hamptons, which was wonderful. You know, the people in AA out there really embraced me. I mean, just everything. I mean, I would go home. 
On Christmas, there was a tree outside my door from people in AA, that people would put a Christmas tree there for me. One time, there was an Easter outfit for my kid on the door. You know, little things like that. I got hit by a car, and um, I was bike riding. That's how I did my commitments. I would bike ride to meetings with my coffee cans and the kid on the back. And, um, and I had grabbed, like, five commitments. I was a little codependent. <laughs> and I was like, I need, I need to be at the meeting, and I need to have a commitment. And, you know, and I was taking all these commitments and driving, you know, this bicycle. And one day, I got hit by a car. So I flew off the bike. The cop comes to my house to give me a ticket, which was weird. And I was like, what is he, your brother? <laughs> He's a drunk driver that hit me, you know. What is that about? But, you know, I, I was an arrogant person even then. But someone from AA came to my house with a moped and a key, and they said, here, this is for you. And I was like, wow. Couldn't believe it because they knew that was how I got to the stores, you know, to get food for my house. I mean, I lived up a long dirt road. It was like a little house on the prairie with a washing machine. It was, like, really out there. And... um <laughs> <laughs> People would come to get me, they'd lose a muffler, you know. It was like one of those places. And uh, it was really scary. But now, I had, so I had this moped. I could drive the kid to school. He was in, like, first grade now, and I'm wearing a purple Ninja Turtle helmet. And I'm driving <laughs> this moped in January. <laughs> And people would say, like, was that you with the purple Ninja Turtle helmet? And I'd be like, oh, my God, small town, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but that was where I was, you know. That was what I, I had. Uh, someone must have prayed for me to have a very slow recovery because I had a very slow recovery. I mean, it took me a long time to resurrect a car from a junkyard. <laughs> you know, I didn't have anything. I mean, I started out with absolutely nothing. Thank God I had a, a sponsor that was a lawyer, and she um, – she had just broken up with a boyfriend, and her daughter was coming home from college. So she had all this furniture she was getting rid of. When I got this huge place in West Hampton Beach, a big, beautiful apartment, it was empty. And she said, oh, you know what? I broke up with my boyfriend. I'm getting all the stuff back from the condo. So she gave me all this white wicker furniture. And it was gorgeous. I mean, I looked like I belonged in the Hamptons. I had wicker. <laughs> hey, I had <have> wicker. <laughs> you know, this is good. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I used to have sober parties all the time because, to me, that was how I stayed sober. When the holidays came, I missed my mother still. You know, I, miss, I had four brothers. I was, like, put out in Long Island so far away from where they were that I needed the fellowship. I would have Thanksgiving parties, New Year's parties, birthday parties. I would always invite the fellowship over because that was how I survived. That's how I got through those holidays without crying the whole time. I'd still cry on Mother's Day, and, you know, I'd still have my moments, but it wasn't as bad. And when I got to that part in step two where it says, loved ones upon whom we heartily depended were taken by so-called acts of God. And that was where I realized, you know, when I had all those resentments with God, I had to get honest and tell him how angry I was at all those things I lost before I could really start to rely on God. You know, and step two talks about you can't defy him and rely on him at the same time. So I had to learn to rely on him. And that means I had to get over my petty differences with God and say, you know what, I don't know why my mother was called back at age 52, but, you know, I'm not in control of that. Someday I'll find out. Not this day, you know, and that's okay. I just have to accept. And for me, acceptance was the hardest thing because I was taught to fight from such a young age. I knew how to fight. I didn't know how to surrender. That's why I picked a boxer, for God's sakes. <laughs> I figured he'd be a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, and he is. <laughs> he is quite a challenge. I married him two years ago, and um, we got married on this little gondola ride at uh, the Venetian. And, uh, you know, we had 16 years, and I figured, okay, maybe he's the one, you know. <laughs> so I married him. But, you know, throughout the years in sobriety, I went back to school um, when, I, when I was uh, – I guess three or four years sober. I wanted to be a substance abuse counselor, right? Who doesn't at three years sober? I'm going to be a drug counselor. I'm going to save the world. You know, I had, I had, <laughs> I had sponsored so many girls, I figured I was a pro, you know. And so I did become a substance abuse counselor, and then I thought, you know, mm, I'd better move on to social work <laughs> because I know me. I'll get sick of, I started, I did do substance abuse counseling for 10 years, and I was very good at it, but I also started feeling like meetings didn't feel like home anymore. Meetings started to feel like work, and that's not good. When you feel like you're at work instead of at a meeting, you know, I can't do that. So I wound up uh, switching to social work and got my bachelor's and then my master's in social work. So, and I did my master's thesis on schizophrenia. So I know all about insanity. 
<laughs> I've, I've seen it firsthand. <laughs> and, you know, the funny thing is, is I would always get the girls in the rooms that would come up to me that always had a dual diagnosis. You know, they were bipolar, they were cutters, they were, I mean, no matter what it was. And I would say, why does God give me the crazy ones, you know? <laughs> and, and it was like there's this, there's this thing that says, she knows, you know, she's been there, she's crazy too, don't let her looks deceive you. <laughs> and that's apparently what it is. I've got that look that says, I've been insane, I can identify, you know. And I have been insane, and a lot of it was control or perceived control. You know, and that was my whole thing, was trying to control my life because my life was so out of control growing up. You know, and I had no control over the people that left me or died or whatever. But today I have some modicum of control over my life, and that's only in how I respond to other people. You know, when I, when I did step two, again, that was my, my saving grace because even in there it talks about how you first lost your faith. I didn't even know my faith was gone. You know, I, I had... Um, I had, like I said, been walking around in this black hole for years, and I didn't even know that I was missing such a huge piece of my life, which was God. And God has directed me from, even when I was in shelters, you know, when I had to leave, if they said, pack up, you can't perform exorcisms, I wouldn't just pack up, and I would think, it's wherever God is sending me is going to be a lesson or a blessing, you know. So, and I learned to look at life that way, that either I'm going to get blessed or I'm going to learn something. And when I remember that life is full of lessons, that I came here to learn, and, and for whatever amount of time I have left here on this earth, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn from you people. You know, I'm going to learn. This is my school. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is my school. You know, I could learn what I learned in the educational system, but that's nothing compared to what I learn in here. Because this is where I learned to stay emotionally grounded. This is where I learned to share what's really going on with me. And people can usually tell, you know, if, if I'm having an off day, they'll say, oh, Donna, how's things going, you know? You're okay? I mean, today I'm approachable, too. I mean, people think I'm friendly, <laughs> and which is, you know, I wasn't friendly before. I mean, I was very angry when I came in the rooms. I was an angry little, I mean, I didn't want to say, you know, <laughs> how I acted in a beginner's meeting. But, you know, when I was a beginner, it was very different. And I'll tell you, the groups out there were so good to me, I mean, I, I, one time I sat at my seat and there was a card there on Christmas and I opened it up and it had $100 in it from Santa Claus. I instantly made them my home group. <laughs> and then, These are my people. <laughs> I am going to click here. <laughs> and then I'll tell you this story. This is a, this is a story about a, a lesson I learned about stealing. I stole. <laughs> I stole this jacket at the Salvation Army. Now, I should have known I was going to steal. I didn't know how to check my motives back then, though. And I went in without a coat in February. That should have told me something. And it was, just, it was a thrift store, Salvation Army. And I went in with my girlfriend. And we were both studying to be counselors, you know. So we go into the Salvation Army. And I'm looking around. And I see this leather jacket. I put it on and pop the tag. I'm like, oh, this is nice, you know. So she's looking at me like, Oh, 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 you know, and uh, and then I pick up the shoes and I go, oh, don't worry, I'm buying the shoes, <laughs> you know. I, I didn't understand what that look was about, right? <laughs> so I'm like, I'll buy the shoes, and she's quiet, you know. She's just like, oh. And so I said, uh, I said, do you know how much I donate to these people? Please, you know, justifying it, rationalizing, you know. And I had, I had donated a lot of clothes because I was a nut. <laughs> I was always getting more clothes, PMS, get rid of the clothes, you know, back and forth. I never had a sane thought in my head. So, um, <laughs> so I was like, sure, I donated so much. They owe me this jacket, for God's sakes. So now we leave, and she's quiet all the way home, and I'm thinking, oh, a little holier than thou. Hmm. It must be nice to be so perfect, you know. And I'm like, whatever, that's her stuff. So I go to church that night. I feel good about my jacket. I wear my jacket to church, you know. And I'm, I'm praying at church, and, and I was at a church in that time where they were holding this baby up, and they were saying, you know, we're praying for this baby that's sick. And I start praying for the baby. Oh, Lord, we lift up the baby, praying for that baby. And then I hear, what about the jacket? And I'm like, what about the jacket? It's nice. <laughs> Very nice jacket. <laughs> and I'm hearing, what about the jacket? And I'm trying to pray. And, I, I, and, you know, you can tell when you're praying if you can get a breakthrough or not. I was not getting a breakthrough to pray for this baby. There was this huge block. And I'm like, what is up with that? So, it's, again, what about the jacket? And I'm like, you really want the jacket? You know, fine. So I take the jacket off and I put it on the altar. I go, the jacket is there. Can I now pray? Pray for the baby. Oh, lift up the baby. So the next day. I realized, okay, God was talking to me, telling me this was not a good thing that I did. 
Okay, so I'm going to have to bring the jacket back and make amends. So I go in my closet and I take my other leather jacket, which I loved, and this one that I stole, and I bring them both back to the Salvation Army on Sunday. And now they were closed, so I just put them both in the bin. And I said, there's my amends. You get your jacket back and my jacket. So I know, program taught me, you can't steal and get away with it, even if at the moment it felt good. Okay, so next day I go to the meeting that afternoon at 3 o'clock, and this guy, Dave, who drove for a paper company, has this huge big truck, and he says, Donna, I got something for you in the truck. Now, of course, I was, you know, I was one of those people where people were always giving me stuff. Donna, like, oh, give it to Donna. She could always use a couch, you know. <laughs> I was one of them, give it to Donna people. And um, so I'm thinking, oh, he's got a big truck. Maybe it's a chair, a couch, you know. And he comes walking into the meeting with a black leather jacket. And he says, this is for you. I knew this was for you. And I'm like, I mean, I hadn't shared about it, nothing. It was like, this was a leather jacket from God. So I wore that, and I was like, wow. And it was perfect for dress clothes or casual. It was better than both of my jackets. And I was like, see, so God gave me something above and beyond what I wanted. If I would have went to him first and said, hey, you know, I need a nice leather jacket, <laughs> I'm sure I would have... <laughs> I'm sure I would have gotten it without having to help myself to the Salvation Army one. <laughs> but, you know, that's where I was back then. Now, as I got older and as I got used to the Hampton crowd, um, like I said, when I first went in, I had, like, I had changed my hair color so many times it was turning green. Because, I mean, I just, you know, you try to fix the outside because the inside's so messed up, so you try dyeing your hair. One day it was orange, next day it was starting to turn green, and I was like, oh, too late, now I messed it up. But, you know, that was where I was back in the early days. And when I started to have a sense of self again, and, when I, uh, and I started to have a sense of self-esteem, you know, the way to, do, to get self-esteem is to do esteemable acts, to do good things for other people, to get out of yourself. You know, I was so self-centered and self-absorbed. I mean, and you might think, oh, she was so poor, it was cute. You know, it was not cute. <laughs> I, was, I was not only emotionally and spiritually and financially bankrupt. You know, I, I was poor. I was homeless. So when I had to restart over everything from scratch, I thank God that I had a slow recovery because I had to attain things in small degrees to get a car on the road. You know, to get, to get my first degree, I had to take the bus to the college. I put my kid in karate so that he would, um, so that he would, you know, get a babysitter that didn't cost a lot. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> the karate instructor was great. He kept my son three times a week at night you know, for 50 bucks a month, and I was able to go to college at night. So, and that kid turned out wonderful. I put him in karate. I put him in Alatot when he was uh, seven. <laughs> Thank God for Alatot. <laughs> Al-Anon, al dog I needed it all. Um, my son, you know, one time I slapped my son. I was mad at him, and he, and he got so mad, and I said, you tell your counselor about it. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> I mean, I was just one of those people. Put him in counseling, you know. That's what they're there for. Tell her I slapped her, for God's sakes. And, you know, I don't have the energy for this. <laughs> you know, I've got to focus on myself. <laughs> So, you know, my son learned at a young age, like, mommy needs her meeting, <laughs> you know. If mommy don't get her meeting, there will be hell to pay. And I learned early on to stop sharing how great things were. Share real, because when you go home and kick the kid, it's not pretty. <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got you've to be real in the room so that when you go home, you have peace of mind and you have serenity. You know, and I was one of those people that I did. I shared honestly. People used to say to me, my God, you're so honest. And I'm like, why wouldn't I be? You know, I didn't even dawn on me, oh, am I supposed to have an ego? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and that was missing. You know, I, um, I didn't have a problem telling my story or, or talking about where I was at that day or what was going on because it was saving my life. You know, you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. So you just have to save your life. And for me, to drink is to die. So I can't afford to drink. So I can't afford not to be honest. You know, and today I've learned that lesson. I've done that, you know, fake it till you make it. But sooner or later, somebody has to know what's really going on inside you. Because, you know, even when I was coming up on my 17th year, I had drinking thoughts, which I hadn't had in years. You know, I had a surgery last year that was really a, a, a heavy surgery. It was a 10-hour surgery on my neck. And, and I have two plates, screws, metal rods, all this stuff from back in the day when I was driving a taxi. When I got my graduate degree in 2000, I was driving a cab and I got hit in the back. So I had to lose three discs. So now they had to go back in and take another one. I actually moved to Vegas thinking that I had arthritis. I didn't realize I had screws loosed. <laughs> 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 you know, 
I, I finally saw a doctor, and they said, you have screws loose, and, and your, your plate's coming off, you got screws loose, and I'm like, so now I'm going to means going, I got screws loose, <laughs> what am I going to do? And, and, you know, and that was a God thing, too, you know, I went back to Manhattan last year to see my son graduate college, he's 22 now, and um, I went back, and while I was there, I said, I better get a second opinion on this neck, you know, and I wasn't too sure about the desert hospitals here either, I was a little nervous, um, so I went to uh, Beth Israel, and I saw a doctor there, and I said, you know, the plate's coming off. I showed him the x-rays. You know, I got screws loose. <laughs> plate's coming off. There was a non-union fusion. One of those bones got lost. I don't know where the hell it went. <laughs> but, um, but so there was a non-union, and so it had to be fixed. And this guy looked at it, and he says, okay. He said the same thing the other doctor said. You're going to need two plates. You're going to need four rods, da-da-da. I'm like, okay. He says, well, I don't have any openings for eight months. Now, this guy was a great surgeon, Michael Norwith, who also saw Gloria Esteban after her severe car accident when they said she'd never walk again. So it was a miracle that I even got in the same office with this guy. I mean, he was like world-renowned surgeon. And um, so just then his secretary walks in and she says, we have a cancellation for next week. And he was like, oh, I'm going golfing. And she goes, no, we're going to get Miss Nevada on the table. And uh, he, said, he said, how are you going to pull her insurance together? I need another surgeon. She goes, It'll happen. So a week later, I was on the table getting this thing fixed. You know, and it's, it's not perfect. You know, nothing's perfect. You know, who likes to walk around with a neck full of metal screws? <laughs> but, um, but it could be worse. You know, thank God I'm not paralyzed. Thank God I'm walking. I mean, and I thank God. And that day when, when he was going to do that surgery, when I heard that I was going on a table next week, I had no fear because I had such a good relationship with God that I had no fear at all. I was like, man, me and God are on the same path. He made this happen. All the doors opened for that to happen. And that to me was when, and even the second doctor, when he interviewed me, he was checking my vocal cords and stuff. He said, how did you get this guy? He said, he's like one of five surgeons that can do this. How did you get him? And I was like, I've got a fabulous father. My, my father takes care of me, you know, and he does. My father, you know, I, I jest about casting out demons and stuff, but if anybody has any issues, you know, you just, <laughs> I mean, I, I still believe that, that God works through people, and I am very strong believer in the power of prayer. I pray for people all the time still. Now, I don't go over and cast out demons. I might secretly think you have one, but <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't go over and address that demon. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've gotten better over the years, see? I hide it. <laughs> and that's the definition of sanity. <laughs> Just look like you, you're not going to do it. <laughs> but, um, but for me, like I said, also I, I learned in that part of my life, when I was wallowing in that emotionalism, like when you read Step 2 in the 12 and 12, it talks about how sometimes faith has to do not so much with the quantity, but the quality of your faith. And for me, I had quantity. I was like, you know, I was walking on water. You know, I was busy. And, um, <laughs> and I had to learn to get quality of faith. I had to learn that not only does God love you, but God loves me. I am worthy today. That God does have, a, you know, a plan for my life. I didn't think there was a plan. I didn't have the blueprint. And I still don't have a blueprint, but I do know one thing. If I get up in the morning and if I read my meditations and if I go to a meeting, everything else is gravy. If, I, if my relationship with God is right, I can be homeless again and I'll be fine because today I have me. I didn't have me before. I just kind of, I had to live completely on faith and just get carried to wherever I was supposed to go next because I had no clue. Today I know, you know, today I know I'm supposed to be here. My foundation is in AA. My life is in AA. I know AA is a bridge back to life. I mean, and I do have a life, you know, for the most part. <laughs> I, I won't even tell you how many pets I have. I'm, I'm a sucker. But um, I have a lot of pets. <laughs> I like pets. I like cats and dogs. And, um, and if I had a bigger house, I'd probably have a horse. But, um, <laughs> but I, I'm a pet person. I love my babies. They're, they're like my... You know, I just love them. And, I, and you know what? I sponsor women today, and, and they are my gift. You know, when I feel like isolating and that phone rings, it gets me right out of myself. That's the gift of sponsees. They don't even realize it. They don't realize it. They think you're doing them a favor. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, of course I'm doing you a favor. Sure. You know, meanwhile, I'm thinking, thank God she called. I, what was I thinking about? You know, it was all me, me, me again, you know. And, and I can go there. I can get full, a head full of Donna if I don't get out of the way. And let God work with me and work with my sponsees and work with the people that are in my life today. You know, we all have this one energy. We're all part of the same cloth. You know, that's the one thing. That's why you can all laugh when I talk about my life. <laughs> because it's like you can identify, you know, with wanting to control other people, with wanting to, to change things. You know, I, I know for me, I was trying to squit, you know, fit the square peg in a round hole. 
Make it work my way. And it never worked that way. And as soon as I let it go, it magically fit. You know, and for me, that's how God works in my life. If I let go of the stuff that I'm carrying, I used to have that God bag, you know. And when I first got sober, I would use that thing. I would have a God bowl on the table. I would take my electric bill. Here you go, God. Here you go. <laughs> Gas bill. <laughs> Here you go, God. <laughs> and I gave it all to God. And, you know, I don't know how it got paid, but it did. Somehow it all got paid. And, and I trust God with everything today. You know, I do. I give my life over to him. And, and that's what works for me. And, of course, you know, I do the rest of the steps. But for the most part, step two really restored me to sanity because I was able to see where my belief system was off. And that's what helped me to get sober and to get right-sized with God. So that's all I got, ladies. And thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.